Good evening, everyone, and welcome to BT's Fly Tying Friday. Tonight, the 24th of November, 2023, you're going to be stuck with watching us tie some older patterns. And we're going to have a weekly tip. Uh, we think it's a new way of splitting tails, or at least it's new to us. But anyway, we're the BTs from Boise, Idaho. And tonight, my lovely wife, Gretchen, is going to start uh, with the... Uh, with her pattern and maybe you want to tell us about it a bit yeah get out of the way this here. is um, another pattern from uh jerry lafontaine's trout flies proven patterns what i really like about this book is that gary will tell you about how the pattern was developed he'll give you then the the uh, tying instructions which <laughs> with gary they're pretty minimal so you kind of have to figure some stuff out yourself and then uh he ends up with the pattern telling you how he fished it and what he did and he, and he he actually gives you the date and time and what happened. First of all, it was interesting to note that this fly was developed specifically for the uh, one fly contest in Jackson Hole. And he believed that it was a, a good pattern for the one fly because it's durable, buoyant, visible and versatile. And uh, it can be fished as wet or dry or both wet and dry on the same presentation. And he says it brings trout up from the bottom. Uh, it doesn't get a lot of last minute refusals. It's an attractor that is ideal for streams like the snake where trout feed optimistically. So um, his log, when he fished, it was on Willow Creek. And I, I'm not sure I know where that is. Do you, Al? I've been there and I'll be dang if I can remember where it is now. It's one of those creeks over there not far from Deer Lodge. Okay. So anyway, they were, he, he and some buddies were fishing it and they, he, one buddy went, stayed down low where the water was smooth and kind of pooling and was having a good time. But he and this other guy went up high and they were kind of struggling and they had fished grasshoppers and he said he fished four different patterns and he was getting some rainbow around 10, but he wasn't getting any of the big ones. So I'm going to read to you about the green wiggler. This just really interests me. I tied on a size eight green wiggler. I edged on my billy through the high weeds to the bank and cast downstream. Then gently, I pulled the rod tip underwater. I put the rod tip underwater, sorry. Bending it against the bottom and stripped the wiggler at a depth of two feet back against the current. When I stopped retrieving, the fly popped up to the surface for a moment, like a dog shaking off water. I peeled out slack line and let the fly drift down the river. A 16 inch brown came up under the fly and jumped into the air with it, with the green wiggler and this pop-up technique. technique. I caught four more nice trout in that 14 to 16 inch rains on a deep water of that little plateau. So I just, and there's a lot more about that particular day, but each one of the patterns in this book will give you that kind of information. So, um, I don't know if you could even get this anymore, but probably on Amazon. I would maybe. go on Amazon. You'll find it in the used book market somewhere. His flies are different. <clears throat> and um, you want to put that away for me. Mm -hmm. And they, the thing that I find is it challenges my tying because it's not always um, traditional tying. Very far from it. <laughs> so, so we'll start with the wiggler. Okay. You want, to, want the recipe or what? Yeah. Want? Let's put up the recipe. So you can tie this in a lot of different colors, but green is one color, as you know, that he used the green, but I have chosen to do orange specifically because it shows up against our green background. <clears throat> and um, this is a 2XL. I'm actually tying it on a 3XL 12, size 12 tail. It's, it's a Cree hackle fiber. You're, you're using a uh, tailing... Packets from Whiting Farm, which is Pardo. Pardo, that's and it's, right. It's got a good modeled modeling like the like the Cree does. Orange body foam in strips, and the wing is Antron. The legs are rubber legs. You can do two or three. Um, I'm going to do three, which if I were a two X on a twelve would be difficult, but with a three X I can get the three on. Grizzly and brown hackle mixed, and of course it's the head is thread. Here's our materials. And I'm, 
all of this is just the plain old stuff, ordinary stuff. Um, my, my hooks, my thread, my hackle, legs, all of the stuff we use. But I would like to speak to this a little bit. I found that I can make a better body if I cut my fold pretty skinny. So that's what I've done on this one, particularly with this fly, because I find myself having to fight the crowding of the, the legs. So um, I have to be real careful with that body. Additionally, if you could notice, I've got a pretty straight, good cut on these. And that's because I use my rotary cutting from my sewing to cut these. And uh, it's a lot easier than using scissors. Get my thread. Here's that uh, pardo. Look at that. Isn't that gorgeous? That is, that is, that, that's, that's, a supreme, that's beautiful, yes. Primo stuff, huh? Yeah. That's some of that um, cocktail on. And my antron and my legs. So I think I'm ready to go. Okay. On the vice? On the vice. All right. Here's your roadmap. Now you're going to notice when I'm tying the stuff that we've tied thousands and thousands and thousands of them, I have to intentionally slow myself down when I'm demonstrating. This fly is going to be a little bit slower because it's kind of touchy when you start doing this stuff. So here's where we're going. This is our, our road map. <laughs> it's a weird, weird looking creature. That's probably why the 16 inch browns jumped all over it, huh? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Let's see if I'm strong enough today. Ah. Good. Okay. When I start this fly, I always start my base wrap at the one half point. That is where the body is supposed to end and where I will tie on the wing and then the legs and the handle. And I don't start up here and, and do a base wrap because I really want to indicate where that body ends to remind myself to stop. So we'll just uh, eyeball this at about the halfway mark and tie on our base wrap holding the waist end up. Now I'm gonna stop back short of that, as you can see, because I am tying with hackle fibers. And uh, as you know, we've talked about it before that they can slip off of the uh, thread if you, if you bring the thread clear mm -hmm. back to here, but tying on this bear's shank keeps that from happening. So we'll just get this pardo down here. We'll pull these out so I've got them all pretty even. Take a hold. And notice I to tore the stem away from the hackle. That way I can keep it straight. I want this about the length of the shank. So we'll measure, then I'm going to hold it. And just wrap back to the start of the bend, which is just above the throat. Right there, if you look at that, that's just right at the throat. So I'll come back, trim off the excess. I'm going to tie on my uh, body material now. Now I'm going to uh, bring this up about here, leaving a little bit vacant because that will be filled in by uh, tying this off. So I'm trying to keep my body as even as I can so I don't have any big humps anywhere. So just like, okay. Bring this back to my tie off point. Remember when you're tying on foam, you want to push it around instead of pull it. 
you keep some of the flotation there and get a nice wrap. And I like to just have those wraps tied against each other, but not crossing over each other or on top of each other. Okay, there's my body. Tie that down. Now I'm going to wrap thread to the point where my head is going to be, come back. So I'm going to take this lower flash, just, and I'm just going to use one strand. It seems to work pretty good. And I want this to go just back to about the bend. Tie it on. Now the tr the one problem with Antron and Poly is it it doesn't compress a lot, so you have mm -hmm. to kind of work at getting a real beveled edge there. And uh, there we go. Now I'm going to turn the hackle. I normally tie them both on at the same time, but on this fly, I kind of like to tie them on separately, primarily because I'm going to wrap them separately. If you've watched me tie before, you know I often wrap my hackles together. But I'm tying this on a little different to kind of spread out the bulk. Okay, there we go. Now see, I still got a little bit of a hump right here. So I'm going to work a bit to make a better platform. These are those, uh, we call them filling up legs. I'll cut one of them off here. What, the, what that is is skirting for bass, bass lures. It's a silicon skirting. Works pretty good for legs and flies. Yeah. Okay, what I do is I just uh, I'm gonna take this and wrap it around my thread, bring it to the top, tie it down. And I'm gonna start doing some crisscross wraps, hopefully helping to place those legs where I want them. and tie on the next one. <clears throat> Same way, I'm gonna pull my hackle over, bring it to the fly, place it where I want it. I'm gonna do some crisscrosses. Now it's really important to kind of get these legs where you want them or you're gonna be fighting them later. There we go. About three wraps. The placement of these is not exact, but when you put the hack on, it kind of straightens them out a little bit too, so. Don't worry as much about it as I would if I weren't finishing up with some hackle. You would think the um, working your way around these legs would be no big deal. We used to, uh, to tie, well, we, we tied a lot of flies commercially, and one of the ones that was very popular in Montana was called the ugly bug. And basically, it was a hair tail instead of a uh, instead of a marabou tail on a roly bugger, and then they would mix legs like this in amongst the hackle absolute pain in the you-know-what to tie. 
legs were always in the always in the way. Always in the way. And as always you see, when so I start wrapping, that's the way we would we'd say, get somebody else to tie them. <laughs> okay, doesn't that look gorgeous? <laughs> now another thing I discovered is got to wrap one hackle at a time. So I'm going to start with this one. And I like to take, and I just have to kind of work my way around these little things here. Take a wrap around the back. Buy this off. end up tying off a leg too. How about that? Okay, there we go. I'm going to have to do a little work on this one. You now to determine the, the length of the legs, I bring them all three up. And trim them just above the hackle like that. And then we'll kind of play with them a little bit, get them where they're supposed to be. This guy wants to be forward, we'll push him back a little. There we go, that's better. I think the one I tied this afternoon was a little better. But... Any other questions? Well, I'm, I'm going to slip over to the materials. I was laying my materials out uh, just a moment ago while we were getting ready. And as you can see, I've gotten rid of the stuff that Gretchen had. And I've got a few other things that I kept. One of her things that we're going to talk about when we get to the tip, and that was the Antron body wool. But... Mm -hmm. I've just got a conglomeration here. We'll just keep flashing back and forth to it as we switch to the materials and, and so forth. But for right now, I am going to show you uh, the slide with the recipe while I read you a little bit about the history of the h &L variant. Now, the history of this fly credits several people for its um, development. I'm going to just read what, what I have here. Um, from John Kareff's website, the h &L variant is credited to R.C. Kaufman of Colorado, and that's on uh, on uh, John's website, riverkeeperflies.com. Legend has it that he tied this fly for President Dwight Eisenhower, who purchased so many of them. Kaufman was able to build a house and lot, hence the name h &L. I believe the lot was on the Frying Pan River in Colorado, and that was from John's site. And during my days as a Montana guy, I spent a lot of time around Bailey's Fly Shop, I heard that the hair, hair wing variant, now keywords hair wing variant, was originally tied by Dan Bailey's Fly Shop in the 30s. President Eisenhower re really liked the fly, and part of his presidential campaign was centered around people uh, liking Ike, one, one of the things, and the other was getting a house and a lot. And in time, this favorite fly and the slogan came together to produce the house and lot variant. In time, it evolved into the H and L variant. And no matter which one of these stories is true today, it's just the H and L as few flies are tied variant style due to the availability of excellent domestic hackle. 
Gretchen and I tied a lot of these over the years. All of them were tied standard hackle style, not variant. Prior to our marriage, though, in the late 70s and through the 80s, I tied a bunch of these, and they were all variants. And we're going to talk about that and what, why that is the case. And so let's start by taking a quick look at the, uh, the fly in question. And it's just a it's just a hair wing fly. White, white tail, white wings, peacock body, half stripped, half regular. And uh, notice that the hackle is long. Well, in fact, we're going to take a, a, a brief detour here. I want to say, let's compare it to this royal wolf that we have in our inventory and tied with what we call standard hackle. In other words, it's a gap and a half. And you'll find that this is just about triple on, on the on the variant style. We're going to take a look at a slide, though. I think it's this one right here. There we go. Jack Dennis wrote a book called The Western Trout Fly Tying Manual or something like that. And anyway, mm -hmm. this is the colored picture in the center of, of his book. Take a real close look at the hackle on the humpy, the royal humpy, and on the variant, the h &L variant. You'll notice that the hackles on all of these flies tend to be a little longer than what we deal with today. And in fact, let's go to the next slide. This is the comparison of the humpy and the h &L variant. And I want you to notice that uh, the equal to the gap, the, the humpy has about double the gap for its hackle. And most of the flies were like that. And the h &L is double plus almost, plus almost a third. So, uh, that that's that's what what the um, the hackle sizing was. We have back on that one, you can see that although that all of the flies had a larger hackle. And why do you think that was? Well, the truth of the matter is, it's because that's what we had available. And you know, early in the earlier in the season, I talked about India, but I was going to <clears throat> do presentations. When I was doing presentations <clears throat> this year, I was going to be working with things that we're used to, things we have to make make do with, not always having what you want. Well, let's go over to the materials for just a moment, and I want to show you something. I had to look like crazy because I haven't, haven't even thought about these for a long time, but some of you may recognize these capes. This is a couple of India capes. In fact, the good feathers has been, have been torn out of both of them. I don't know why I still got them, but I do. And I want you to see that uh, these feathers right here are about a size six. And I want you to see how long that feather is. Let's let's move over to the vise. And you can see that uh, that's a pretty short feather for fibers that stick way the heck up in the air. And um, there's not a lot of feathers on that. But that's what we had to work with. And by the way, this was a number one. And uh, this one also was a number one. That's what we had to work with. So you can rest assured that finding size 16 and 18 hackle was really difficult. And we were sure thankful when Henry Hoffman came along and, and started making the, <clears throat> the genetic hackle available uh, in the smaller sizes. Since I'm going to go ahead and just tie this H&L because there's some... There's some fly tying techniques that it contains that are very applicable for a whole lot of other patterns, though we're going to be tying this as a variant. I'm going to be using black and white. And we need to talk about that for a minute. I'm going to move both of them over to the vise. I'm going to be tying with the white first, and I'll explain to you why, because most of the flies that you'll find tied around the country um, if they're tied with black thread, they're tied with black thread all the way through. One of the things that Gretchen and I started doing that added what we thought was a touch of class to our uh, hair wing flies, especially the flies that were tied with calf tail, is that we would divide the wings, tie on the tail and all that stuff with white, and that crisscrossing between the wings wasn't an ugly black in amongst the white. It was white on white, and it was like they magically... Uh, were divided and standing up there all by themselves when in, in fact they weren't. But let me just put my thread base down, wrapping to the 
end of the shank, which lines up with the throat of the barb. And I'm going to go back one half way and stop right about there. Now I'm going to switch though before this fly is over and we're going to finish up with black. But for right now, what we're doing is all the thread that's going to come in contact with, if you will, with the uh, calf tail is going to be white. So they blend together. Let me get over here to the calf tail and I'll cut off a, a bundle of that because we're, we're going to need to talk about that here. And it's, it's very appropriate that we use this as an exam as an example of okay good now before i tear everything out and go and clean everything out I, this is a very good example of the good and bad parts of the hair any bundle of hair whether it comes off of an elk hide deer moose whatever has various layers and in this bundle right here we've got the tips out here they're really good stuff and right under it is some really good stuff. And then I want you to see all this crap that's sticking up there. Okay, layers one, two, little bit of layer three, and everything else from here on down goes away. You see so many flies screwed up by fly tires who have fairly good skills and don't want to throw away a third of a cent worth of hair when they just came back from the fly shop with a $1,000 fly rod in their car. I mean, it's... That's, I know that's a little bit of a stretch, but the truth of the matter is don't be afraid to throw away the stuff that's going to cause you trouble. Layers one and two, and now I'm going to get out over the bin, waste bin and run my finger rapidly up and down through that. And you can see that already starting to work its way out. And I don't want it to get all over the camera lens. So I'll be right back. Now I'm holding that bundle of hair in the same identical place, except all this stuff from here back is gone. All the short fibers, and the fuzzy stuff and the hair down along the, the tail and all of that. So that's what I have left. Now, because this particular calf tail, and all calf tails, but this particular one has a, a fairly long number one layer with the number two layer underneath, I am going to pull off number one layer and lay these on top of each other because calf tail is notorious for not wanting to stack. And if I kind of Halfways line them up a little bit. You can see that the back end is all misaligned, but that's okay. That's what scissors are for. And now I'm going to put them into my hair stacker and even them up. And I'll get a lot better even on my bundle of hair by kind of hand stacking them a little bit beforehand. We don't need to do that on, on hair like deer and elk or moose, but on calf tail, you really need to. Good. Now that's pretty well stacked. And I'm just going to set that in. I want that to be as long as the hook shank. And, uh, and I want you to notice it's just slightly longer than the hook shank because I'm tying it variant style and because we want the, the, the fly to sit on the water, tips of the tail and the hackle. And then so it's just a little bit longer. Kind of balance the fly out a little bit. Now I'm binding this into place right up on top of the hook. And because it's calf tail, I can tend to put stronger wraps on it. Now, one of the areas where you often get into trouble and you're going to see it, we, we do this a lot, is that we anchor our thread right here in front of the cutoff fibers. And now I am going to pass the thread under that bundle of hair and come back to that same point. We call this right here the pull point or the anchor point. And what I've done here is maybe you can see, okay, yeah. The hair tends to sneak down and go around the hook. And, and what this little loop of thread right there does is keeps that from going around the hook. Wrap forward to the front. Now remember that uh, the loop under the, under the hair, we're gonna be talking about it again. Let me go back and get another, another bundle of uh, calf tail. And I don't need to go through all the gyrations of how I hand stack and everything. I'm just going to get rid of the, the fibers that I need to. I'll stop at the waste bin on the way to the vice. Now I've got a, a pretty good bundle, but I would say about twice the bulk of the tail. Now I'm just going to slip that into my stacker. There we go.
And I'm just gonna tie that in so it's about equal to the length of the hook shank. And really bind it in place with tight wraps right there. And I'm leaving a space right here so that when I trim, the trimmed ends can lay right in against those trimmed ends from the tail. Do that right now. Let me see just how. Okay, I'm going to have to. There, I got a nice even trim, a good severe cut. And that blends the two, the waste material from the wing and from the tail together. Now it didn't happen this time, but usually, let me get this over here. Usually what happens is there's four or five fibers that cross over like that, and they're gonna end up on the far side wing and we don't want that. Well, you notice that what we did to the tail, we wanna make sure that they stay on top of the hook. We are at our pull point back here. And the reason we want a pull point that's back away from the correction place right here, the correction, is because we want this thread pulling in a, in a straight a line as we can along the hook shank. If we try to do the same thing from right here, what happens is you end up pulling the wing over to the side as you do that. That's because the pull point is too close to the uh, work zone or whatever you want to call it. But when you let me make sure I got those, oh, I got one now, I got one messed up, so I got to straighten it back out. Okay, good. So what I'm going to do now is little that around. There we go. Okay. Is bring this up around between the hook and the hair and then right back to my pull point. Notice that I went right back to here. But what that does is gives a nice elongated pull, if you will, under that. So it isn't pulling the wing off to one side or the other. It's just lifting it and separating it from the hook shank. Okay. No, no, we'll just pick up the pace now. I've been jabbering along too much on, on these materials, but this is an important feature of any hair wing tying that you do, but it's particularly important with calf because the darn stuff, calf tail is crinkly, if you haven't noticed. I think you got a little more. A little on more on the right hand one. Yeah. Get, a little, get a little bit out of that right hand one. Okay, there we go. That looks a little bit better. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is uh, finish my crisscross wrap between the two wing posts. Now I'm going to take the offside wing and wrap around the post all three or four times. And then set that wing in place and anchor it to the body. You can see that that's uh, just set right in there and anchored. Now I'm going to get this near side wing. Wrap several turns around it. And now, whoops, I just pulled that off of there. I didn't want to do that. And now I'm going to pull that up and anchor it back to the body. So now we have a divided wing with those wings, as you can see from that angle, standing at about a 90 degree angle. Okay. Now I'm going to wrap a little bit of a thread dam in front, more as a hackle platform that's closer to the size of the body back here. Not quite, but it's closer. And I'm going to switch now to black because I want black from this point on. And we'll just cut this off. And as you can see already now, I pretty well got a pretty good black base where my hackle is going to be wrapped. And of course, I want to have black in front too. But for right now, I need to strip my peacock. Let me get over here and get a chunk of peacock. Okay, there's a, there's a nice long one right there. Now, what I'm going to do is I'll take that off of the stem here. And I need to leave, oh, I need to make a division. And right about here to this direction or in this direction, I need to strip these fibers off and these will be left on. So it's not quite half, it's more like one third, two thirds. But one of the things that I found that works really well, there's several ways to do this, and we're gonna slow down for a minute and talk about it. 
One of the ways is to take this piece of peacock and lay it on an eraser and take another eraser and erase away those fibers. Now that gets it pretty good on one side and you're gonna to need to turn it over to the other side of the peacock and erase it away. Another way that works fairly well is to strip it between your fingernail or thumbnail like that. And the way that works really well, but is very, uh, uh, can be a little bit, not dangerous, but you can ruin your materials, is the way Gretchen and I did it when we were tying many, many of these flies. You didn't sit there trying to strip it off with your thumb. It takes forever to get the thing done. What you take is a whole bundle of these fibers like that, strip them off of the peacock curl. You take a small container that's half water and half Clorox. And you take and swish about this much into that Clorox. And when you see that about three quarters of the fibers have melted and gone away, you want to rinse it because the, the Clorox will finish eating off those other fibers um, long before you get to the rinse water. So you want to head for the rinse water a lot sooner than what you really needed to. Well, let me just run my tying thread back here to the back of the hook. And I'm just going to There we go. Get that tied to the bottom. And right now you notice that I'm getting a nice black base over the top of that white. And why is that? Because I'll guarantee you, if you just leave that white there and uh, wrap over it, you're going to have white peeking through. It just, it, invariably, it's, you're going to get messed over that way. Anyway, so I'm going to start wrapping a stripped peacock body at the back over the black working my way forward. And I've got too long of a piece of strip, but that's okay. I am going to wrap forward and then come back over it. Go back and forth over it a time or two so that I get a half of a body that's stripped and a half of a body that's regular peacock, unstripped. So now you can see that we've got the evenly divided body there. Let me take a couple of turns around that, a little bit forward, use some of that, the waist of the, of the peacock to build up a little bit of my hackle base. And now I'll just go back here and come back over to my materials. Show me clear to the back. I've got some already sized hackle, and this is a size 12 in the, in the vise. And uh, these are size eight hackles. So I'll just take them over here. And that will give us a, about the, the triple the gap that we're looking for. And we'll tie this guy on. Just like we do on all the others, I want you to notice that I'm leaving some bare stem there so that I don't have fiber sticking back when I... Uh, Go to wrap my first turns of hackle. All right. I'll just get uh, several turns behind, several turns in front. And back in the old days, one of, these fly, one of these flies of those feathers that I showed you on those India capes, we most of the time would, would, would take uh, four or five feathers to do one dry fly. Okay. And I'll pull this up and back so I can wrap my thread head jam knot and I'm Right now, what I'm doing is um, dog legging, legging the hackle so that it bends and has less is less likely to pull out.
Now, all I can say is uh, be thankful that you don't have to deal with India capes anymore. Anyway, but there is an h &L variant. As you can see, the hackle is pretty good sized. And um, any questions on that? We bring you these free presentations once a week. And the only thing we ask in return is if by chance you feel like you need some fly tying instruction, you can go to btsflyfishing.com and there's the books available that, that we have available or you'll, you get them off of Amazon. And I want you to notice in the upper left corner, it says Humpy Encyclopedia. That book is available to you two ways. If you want a paper copy of it uh, to, to actually have uh, in your hand and, and look at, it costs you 20 some bucks. Uh, but if you're willing to do a download version, we have a link there and you can download that for free. And uh, if you want to know what a polyhumpy is, you're just about three clicks away from finding out. Any other questions? Remember, btsflyfishing.com. Okay. And uh, if there's no other questions, Give a tip. it's time for the weekly tip. The weekly tip, we're going to be talking about a new method of splitting tails. And um, it's not like splitting hair. <laughs> That's exactly what we're doing. We're, we're splitting hair. Okay, well, here is where we're headed. Now, most of you know that I'm, I'm for my own fishing, I don't much care one way or the other whether the tail is split or not. I think once it gets good and wet and gets drunk through the water a few times, it's not split anymore. But this is what we're after because a lot of times people want that split tail, and that's fine. This is hackle fiber. Is that part of yeah, the, this is a hackle fiber split tail. Okay, let me uh, set that aside. What I've done on this illustration, though, is I've already taken my bodkin and did the first thing that you have to do, which is kind of spread those fibers apart a little bit, because I'll guarantee you, I don't care who you are, you have a heck of a time getting your thread you come up through those fibers, whether you're pulling a, a, a thread up through, there's a loop of thread that you can use to do that. And in fact, I'll just take a, a white bundle and show you how that works. And this is what I used for years and years until I figured out what I'm going to sh share with you tonight. But this is just a, a piece of white or just a piece of long thread pulled out behind see how i just kind of looped it around and you bring it up between your tails tie it down and you've got a split tail did that for years and years guarantee I, I would always forget to cut off a long piece of thread or i'd have to go looking for it never was there when i wanted it now you remember what we were doing just a little bit ago when we were keeping the hair on top of the hook now, I want you to watch carefully what I'm going to do here. I am going to use that same process, kind of. And that is I'm going to come up through that hair, come forward to my anchor point, the, the tying, see this point right up here? This is parallel, and it's anchored right here. And I, I'll go back through that again, because I want you to notice this is really important. We come up under and through. Come back to the pull point and anchor it. Now, again, we're going to go into the far side. We're going to come up, through, over, to the pull point. And what we have now is our divided tail. And uh, again, the reason we have a pull point is you can probably see it right there. We get a nice even pull at that here. It doesn't push it off to the side. Now I've tried, and I've seen some people pretty good at it, but I used to try to do this routine. I would say, well, shoot, I'll just do this from back here. And uh, it, what end, ends up happening is one tail goes up and the other one goes down. And this new method that I just managed to mess everything up here and get everything tangled <laughs> is uh, just the way it is, you know, folks. And, and I am going to go back to my original Way of doing it, I'm going to come forward to the pull point, 
I am going to come back under, back to the pull point, get everything reseparated, and um, that looks pretty good. We got it. We got it split. However, my hair is askew in every direction because I got three or four turns of of, of hair, a thread in there that I didn't want to have from <clears throat> the other demonstration that I just messed up. <clears throat> Okay, well, I have one more tip, but this is a this is a uh, throwback. John Kreft gave me this idea. He has this thing called a throwback Thursday fly. Oh, he had you probably need to know about this. Um, John has this really great weekly blog, and he he does it twice a week. Riverkeeper flies, and there's the website. You go to that website, and you can. Uh, request to, to get on his his uh, mailing list uh, John Kraft gave me gave me this idea this is the throwback tip now you'll recall that Gretchen was using this material you notice a little kink where it folds over the over the cardboard, always getting in your way. Well, there's a fix for that. We did this last year. And as a result, my hair dryer, which I really need a hair dryer, you know, is in the tying room all the time. And I'm gonna put it on. Now let's see if that thing, uh, we don't have any kinks anymore. Well, does that work on other stuff? Jim Ferguson, listen up. You didn't think I saved this. Remember that feather, Jim? Yep, that's the one we straightened out. It used to look like this one. You can see that curve in that feather, that feather? Well, it was straightened out by using the hot air method. So just a tip for you. That's it for now. It's time for sharing on BT's Fly Tying Friday. This is where we turn to all of you for inspiration. There's your fly. Oh, I like that. Oh, nice. What is that body material, Chuck? That's, That's that. organza. Uh, oh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you could, I, this is a fork tail, you know, somewhat like a stonefly, I guess, if you wanted to think sure. of it. It's really, it's really an imitation or a, an attractor pattern and a tungsten bead on the top of it to get it down. But it was very simple. And this is the reason I wanted to show it is because of the, the cross sure. leg method of putting legs on. And, oh, there, that is a good one. Did that look good? Oh, than what I tied. Well, yeah, we're we're gonna bring you down here to start working the vice, Evelyn. This is cool. Yes. And here's your other one. Wonderful. Love that. Hard to do the white, so that's why the green is there because your background I, was green. I totally understand. You were trying to do white wings against a white background, and that doesn't work very good. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thank you much, Jim Ferguson. Yeah. Yeah, what okay. it is, is uh, usually I have a, a San Juan Flycaster meeting and I tie a Christmas fly. And this is the body for that. But what you saw me do was I had, you know, when you want when a tie for mounting and you wrap your body hackle and your collar what I usually do is take a piece of paper and then take a clip like this and it's noticed right at the right up here it's got a natural circle a round, a round spot for you to go around the hook yeah and go like that and put the other one on there and let it sit for several hours. 
And if you wet that a little bit first before doing it, what happens is, is that none of these fibers are coming out like this towards the glass on your frame fly. It just makes it nice and compact there. Now, what I'm going to do for the wing, I've got some bustard. I've got some red and green. And what I'll do is I'll take the bustard Nothing marries like mustard. Mustard grabs. Yeah, and then you'll you'll repeat the process with your other colors as well. And then I'll put the uh, a a strip of mustard on top of that, and then I'll alternate it, and it, it really gets a real zebra like appearance to it but the nice thing about bustard is that you can when you get all done you can shape that wing pretty much so that it will fit right into the right into the curve of your tail yeah this was given to me by uh, Jim Schulmeyer. And uh, it's a, what it is, is a, you guys were showing, you know, how you cut strips. Well, you got a knife blade. You got a piece of plate glass. And then you have this piece right here. And it's got one of those materials that it's kind of like you can cut into the blade will cut into it slightly but uh, you put the material you want to cut between this glass plate and this wooden thing and sure. then you, you can come and you can slice it come back slice it and you can make it whatever size you want when we <clears throat> Pretty and cool. My what I was just going to say, rather than having to worry about it, if you just have a piece of plate glass and you take emery paper and, like my hand was a piece of emery paper, and you go back and forth on it to dull that edge, both sides of it, then you don't cut yourself, but it makes a nice straight edge for running a blade up against and sure. if you even had that cutter that that uh, Gretchen was talking about you know and if you were somebody asked what do you use for an edge well a, a piece of plate glass makes a real nice edge for for cutting things good tip good tip yeah. hey everyone thank you for joining us on this day after thanksgiving for now, it's a wrap. Until next Friday, we'll be looking forward to seeing you all again.